with no further ado, welcome everyone. I will do the housekeeping in a minute. Um, a warm welcome to the third and final installment of the International Roundtables being held as part of the Energy Institute's Generation 2050 initiative in the run-up to COP26. My name is Guilherme Castro. I'm chair of the Young Professional Network uh, London branch, and I'm here with Kelvin, who is the chair of uh, Young Professional Network Nigeria branch. We are running this event in partnership. And these events are a bit different in that young professionals are hosting senior figures from the world of energy to discuss urgent global challenges from different regional perspectives. For those who don't know the YPN, we are part of the Energy Institute, acting as the hub of tomorrow's energy leaders. Our mission is to draw together cross-discipline energy professionals from diverse backgrounds to learn about and discuss key energy issues. And we provide a platform from which they can grow and develop walls, building strong multidisciplinary networks, spanning the whole energy sector. And this event is really important considering COP26. The event that will take place next month in Glasgow is a once in a lifetime opportunity for our generation to debate and guarantee a compromise with our planet. Even after several pledges towards net zero from countries and companies across the world, only 20% of the emissions reductions would be achieved by 2030 with the current pledges, according to the International Energy Agency's last week report. This is far behind the necessary to deliver the Paris Agreement and keep temperature below 1.5 degrees. And energy is an essential driver to achieve net zero, not only decarbonizing our own sector, but also support correlated sectors to deliver their clean and sustainable development ambitions. For this reason, we decided to ask the question, does foreign energy investment help or hinder the SDGs in the global south? And to answer this question, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers today, bringing a diverse background in energy and sustainable development, but also in different stages on their career. I will give the opportunity for them to introduce it, uh, in more details, but just to anticipate, we have Mervyn Zeta, who is a product and service delivery manager in Schulenburg. We have Demi uh, Edozoman, who is Managing Director for Emerging Markets in Total Energy Ventures. We have Samuel Adunreke, who is founder of Innovia Hubs. And we have Dr. Muzonda Mumba, who is Director of the Rome Center for Sustainable Development. Coming to our housekeeping, um, every people in our audience will have the microphone muted during the, the event. The round table will proceed now with Kelvin sharing more information about the Generation 2050 Manifesto. We will give um, in the first part of the, the round table, five minutes for each speaker to introduce themselves and answer our events question. Does foreign energy investment help or hinder the SDGs in the global south? After they share the answers, we will move to a round table where we will have the opportunity to hear the speaker's perspective about the SDGs, COP26, energy investment in global south and other related topics. We will be looking to bring your questions into play too. So please don't hold back adding those to the questions box during the event. Uh, Robin is here helping us to moderate and will pass the questions to us as well. And finally, please extend the debate on social media. Tell us what you think on the conversation with using the hashtag generation2050. That's all on the housekeeping. I will pass the ball to Kelvin now. Hello everyone. Um... Welcome and thank you again for joining us. <clears throat> My name is Kelvin Enuma and I'm the chair for the Young Professionals Network Nigeria. Uh, for those of you in the audience who don't know, Generation 2050 is a global initiative led by the Energy Institute to amplify young voices in the energy and climate discourse. I'd like to give you a snapshot of what the Generation 2050 community looks like. The community is made up of 1,000 young energy professionals from diverse geographies, sectors, and professional backgrounds. It's made up of scientists, engineers, analysts, and commercial professionals coming from places such as London, Lagos, Singapore, and San Francisco, and working in oil and gas through to nuclear, renewables, and energy efficiency. Today, we are studying or in the early stages of our careers in energy around the world. Tomorrow, many of us will be in senior roles across the industry. This means that we are going to help lead a sector shaped by decisions made before us. The actions taken this year are particularly important, both at COP26 and in the recovery 
from COVID-19. Uh, the actions taken now and in the near future will determine the state of the industry and its carbon footprint for many decades to come. In November 2020, as a community, we published a manifesto detailing how young energy professionals view the progress towards meeting targets for climate change mitigation. I'm sure many of you must have read that manifesto. The views summarized in the manifesto are pretty hard hitting. Overall, it calls for government and energy leaders to take more decisive action on both universal energy access and climate change mitigation. The manifesto outlines that nearly three quarter of us fear we will inherit a world that is off track on limiting global temperature increases to below two degrees. One of my favorite parts of the manifesto is that when asked for the top reasons uh, we chose to study or work in energy, nearly 60% selected tackling climate change. That means that the majority of us care about the challenge enough to let it shape our career choices. And we aren't deterred by the scale of the challenge. Furthermore, 55% joined the industry because they consider it dynamic and interesting. While we see large challenges ahead, many of us are driven by a sense of purpose and excitement about the opportunities in the industry. I think this is a fantastic thing to keep in mind uh, when discussing the urgent need for climate action. Today, we are specifically talking about whether the integration of the sustainable development goals as the main framework to support the decision-making process of foreign energy investments can help Global South nations to become more sustainable. And as content for discussion, uh, I think we are going to kick off with some short opening uh, comments from our guests. And uh, firstly, I would like to pass the, um, the mic next to Demi Edoson, Managing Director, Emerging Markets, Total Energies Ventures. And uh, Demi, I would like to I'd like you to introduce yourself and uh, quick, quickly to, to know your view regarding the question of does foreign energy investment help or hinder the SDGs in the Global South? Demi. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for having me, for inviting me to join the panel today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it was, um, as I said, my name is Demi Edesomwa, and I'm Managing Director of Emerging Markets for Total Energies Ventures. And so just to talk a bit about um, Total Energies, which is the global energy company. Some of you might know it as Total, but we rebranded uh, earlier this year on the 1st of June uh, in order to be able to show uh, our pivoting or rebranding towards a broader energy portfolio. And so many have known us as a conventional oil and gas company for nearly a hundred years now, but uh, very, very cognizant of the climate emergency and our role and the part that we have to play. We have decided to really drill down and uh, to be able to also reduce the carbon intensity of our energy mix. And so we're moving uh, full speed towards renewables, which will form the largest share of our portfolio in the years to come. And we have made a commitment to be net zero by 2050 and to work with society to be able to achieve these goals. And so as part of that, we are significantly ramping up our renewable energy capacity, which is currently at about seven gigawatts today, and to be able to ramp it up to about 100, gig 100 gigawatts over the next um, 10 to 15 years. And so uh, for us, and specifically what I do within Total Energies is that I invest um, in startups. Uh, so that is our mandate to invest in startups that are promoting a low carbon future. And so we are supporting startups across the globe. Uh, we have teams in the US and, in, and across Europe as well. And we, our mandate is global. And what we are doing is to find and foster startups that are looking for solutions either to prevent or to mitigate carbon emissions. And so that for us is how we see investment. So it's a very interesting topic that we will be discussing today. And I believe that um, first, uh, well, definitely I believe that investment by their very nature is that the fact that a country or a company has found something that is worth uh, doing a project that is worth implementing and, and does not have sufficient resources to be able to implement this by itself and is therefore looking for partners globally to be able to implement this project and I believe that by the nature of it that it must be something that is positive and that is why a company or a country has decided to go ahead with it. 
And therefore, I believe that by its very nature, if you're looking for foreign investment, hopefully it's towards a common good. And um, therefore, my view of this topic is that obviously it's quite nuanced, but I believe that there is indeed much more scope for help rather than hindering the SDGs. And especially when you look at energy investments, uh, our view within Total Energies is that energy really is really at the core, is one of the staples along with food, water, health, of course, we believe is really one of the core anchor SDGs that if people have access to clean electricity, it does have significant impact on many other areas of life. And so my, my take on this subject is that there are very many ways in which indeed energy investments can help the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Demi. And I really, I really appreciate your optimism uh, when you say that it really would uh, help you know, and I think we'll have more of this conversation later on when we get into the, the discussion session. Uh, next, I would like to invite Samuel. Uh, Samuel uh, is the founder of Innovia Hub, uh, Innovia Hubs, Nigeria. And Samuel, uh, over to you. Hi, Samuel, are you there? You are muted. Yeah, good morning, Kevin. Good morning, good morning everyone. Happy to good morning. Welcome. be on this panel. Thanks for Samuel, we, we are having some problems with the connection, I believe. So Uh, Let so, me, so Samuel, we we can't yeah, hear you. I think uh, I can hear you, and I can see everyone clearly. Okay, I, we can. I think okay. I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah so. uh, I think uh, relatively it was because of my camera. Thanks for having me, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Okay. Yes. Yes. So go ahead. Uh, Kindly introduce yourself, and we would like to uh, know your view regarding the question uh, posed for this event, which is, does uh, foreign energy investment help or hinder SDGs in the Global South? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for again. My name is Samuel I'm from Nigeria, and I'm in Nigeria, the founder of Innovia Hubs, and uh, executive director of Innovia Foundation, and we've been uh, in a lot of uh, policy advocacy actions um, networking um, as related sorry Samuel uh, we we the connection is is not really strong at the moment so we are we're barely being able to hear you um if we can jump meanwhile to um, Dr. Muzonda could you could you introduce yourself and and also um, answer a question about uh, if the foreign investment uh, hinder health, the Global South countries, please. Great. No, thank you so very much for inviting me and I'm really excited to be here. My name is Musonda Mumba and I'm the director for the UNDP Rome Center for Sustainable Development, which is also co-hosted by the Italian government's Ministry on Ecological Transition. So it's, it's such a great opportunity here because I've spent the last 20 plus years working mostly on environmental issues around the world. I'm originally from Zambia, but have worked in different parts of the world and really looking at sort of the environmental perspectives around nature-based solutions, climate change, adaptation, et cetera. Now, I just wanna go a little bit back because next year, 2022 marks 50 years since, um, and I know many of you listening are probably under the age of either 40 or in your mid twenties or thirties, 
50 years ago, the Club of Rome's founder, um, Aurelio, actually requested a study to look at the limits of growth. Um, and, and it was very innovative and very ingenious, actually, of the time. This is 1972. And this modeling, which was done really on the capabilities and technology of what would be the equivalent of your iPhone um, or you know, smartphone, modeled and showed that by 2020, 2021, the planet would be in such a crisis that we would have used so much resources and would be at the edge of a tipping point. Now, what does that say? That already says in terms of the pressure that we've put the planet on. Now in comes the impact and, and, and classic dynamic of climate change, which we have seen in terms of the impact. So in going back to your question, um, we do know that obviously the energy element has been a critical factor of human survival, be it economic, social, and also environmental, those very three pillars of the SDGs. Now, what we also do know is that greenhouse gases are very much the effect and the challenge that um, is obviously manifesting in ways that it's manifesting that the planet is really tethering on the edge with what we see in its form of impacts in um, be it floods, droughts, extreme weather events, etc. Now, what does that mean in terms of energy? And I'm glad that Demi is here and others that may be a part of, you know, institutions that for the for the longest have been part of the problem, you know, fossil fuels. And we as also humanity as citizenry, our dependence as humans on the fossil fuel structure. Now, more recently, there's been an outlook report that was produced by the International Energy Agency, IEA, which produced this outlook to just let, basically say, this is the first time in the history of the IEA, and I speak on record, you can check their report online, it's there, where it said, we need to keep the fossil fuels on the ground, and we can do it. This is a conversation that we've, you know, for 30 years, environmentalists have caused alarm and said, look, we are in danger. And so when we talk about SDGs, and we've only got nine years to reach those SDGs, and I'm glad that you're also talking about 2050, because your generation, your constituency in the next five to six years, in fact, in the next year, you're gonna be sitting at that negotiating table. So I see this as an opportunity. I see this as an opportunity where, um, you know, foreign investment, and particularly I'm speaking for Africa as a continent I belong to and swear I've done a lot of work, well, we've seen this opportunity and this window, particularly around renewables, but now so as we all navigate a post-pandemic world, the opportunity for green jobs, because we're now talking about a green recovery. And I'm glad that when Demi, when Demi spoke that, you know, um, Tupal is also exploring and investing and we're talking to Italian constituencies such as Penny, NL, um, uh, the company that deals with renewables. And really this is a window of opportunity that Africa has an opportunity to leapfrog. Even as we talk about transitioning, we, we, we don't have a moment. We have already seen from the IPCC, the, inter, you know, the inter International Panel on Climate Change that has shown and said, we are in danger. We've only got one week to go to COP26. And that COP26 is that opportunity where we need a rethink. And I'm glad that young people in Milan at the pre-COP called it out. They called it out and said the changes have to happen now if we're going to meet the SDGs. And also when we talk about renewables, what does that actually really mean in terms of technology, in terms of jobs, in terms of women and youth, but also more importantly, in terms of those enabling environments, the policies, the regulations, the structures. And so I'm really looking forward to the discussion as we unfold and pack. Apologies for my dogs barking. I think I'll put my <laughs> head on shortly. Uh, but this is the plight of working from home. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion and just hearing thoughts and, and, and really calling out some of the challenging elements. And, and as you rightly said, you and Kelvin, you want to inherit a planet that is a living planet, a planet that is meaningful for your futures and a planet and something that Roman Krasnarik in his book asked, are we good ancestors? Are we living a planet that once you're gone 100 years, 200 years from now, your policies will be looked back by your future generations to say they did good? And that is a question that we need to also be asking ourselves. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Musunda. And uh, that's a great scene setter, really. And um, <laughs> I'm really glad we're having this conversation. 
Uh, so, so Samuel, if you can hear us while you take out a bit of time to sort out the, the internet connection problems, uh, it'd be good to you know, get your own introduction. Uh, but for now, let's go straight to Mervin. Uh, Mervin, Mervin, if you are there, Mervin is the uh, business line product and service delivery manager for Slumberger West Africa. And uh, Mervin, if you are there, over to you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And thank you, um, Kelvin, for the introduction. And thanks to EI for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here and speaking alongside very distinguished uh, panelists. Um, good to see you, Demi, again. And good to see you, uh, Dr. Musunda. It's lovely to connect on here. Hopefully, we'll connect afterwards. But I'm delighted to be speaking here. And um, like Kelvin had said, my name is Mervin Azeta. I'm a business line product and service delivery manager at Slumberger. And for those of you who may not know Slumberger, it's the global um, energy and technology service provider for the industry. We develop and create amazing technologies that unlock access to energy for the benefit of all. We were originally um, oil and gas focused, but now like Demi's company, Total Energies and many other companies in the oil and gas industry, we're becoming integrated energy companies. What, some of us are even becoming energy and data companies, you know, and providing data platforms to, you know, scale innovation. But I'm delighted to still work with Slumberger because we are driving and scaling innovation today in the energy industry. We're creating even technologies that will be, be delivering as much benefit in the new energy landscape. So we have technologies in the lithium and energy storage space. We have technologies around carbon capture and storage, and as many other new technologies that are evolving um, with the new energy transition. Uh, in my role, I'm responsible for operations across two business lines um, in Nigeria and West Africa. I also double as uh, a business development manager for one of the business lines. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we have you know, customers um, satisfied with our services across the upstream and the midstream sector of the industry. Um, I'm also responsible for ensuring that we have the right talent to deliver the job, especially now that we have a bad rap about the oil and gas industry. It's important that we shed the light on the positives of the energy industry and particularly the oil and gas and the role it's going to play in driving the transition and advancing progress in that front. So I'm delighted to be here again. And with respect to the topic, I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, and just like Demi, I share the sentiment that energy sits at the heart of the SDGs, definitely addressing energy poverty or energy um, lack of energy access would create and offer several potential gains across the other SDGs. We know that there are so many interlinkages between energy and the other SDGs, for example, creating access to energy for women and girls who help them, you know, get the best education, access quality health care and stay well, um, would also scale um, economic growth across the economies where they're, they're, they're deployed. So if you deploy renewable energy um, to as many communities across the global south economies, you would have people accessing basic services as clean drinking water, um, elect, um, electricity, um, sanitation and security services. It will stimulate innovation with creation of new jobs and tackle poverty in general. So investments in my opinion, and especially energy investments will certainly help you know, sustainable development across all the goals that we have listed, which is 17 in number. And we've seen over time that um, foreign investments are generally considered as catalysts for economic growth and development, especially when they're implemented in an economic, um, environmentally and socially sustainable manner. They could stimulate the accumulation of capital in these economies. They could drive technology and skills transfer. They could encourage the creation of new jobs and improve market access for those of us who are entrepreneurs. You know, you can get access to real markets where you can sell your products. I also find that investments are subject to some operational conditions, especially if you have local human capital that can leverage that and harness the resources for good. 
You also need to have institutional capacity, for example, if you have robust laws and regulations, or you have those institutions and agencies that can help you deploy this capital in such a way that it delivers the benefits and meets the targets, then it's great. If you have domestic supply chains that are very functional, then your investment will certainly scale um, uh, progress on all of those SDGs. I'll stop there. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marvin. And um, I, I, so, so Guy, I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem that everybody is optimistic. I don't think it's a problem, right? It's never uh, a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a problem. Okay. So, but I, I'm glad that we are all optimistic that um, that these investments are going to be a great help to uh, global south uh, uh, countries. And just before we dive into the the discussions, the deeper discussions, you know, uh, really where all the guests would have the opportunity to expand shit and, you know, uh, talk about different aspects, because I know I really like the fact that, um, for example, Total, you know, has rebranded to Total Energies. I like the fact that uh, Slum BJ is also, you know, going towards that line. And with, with the number of things that um, that's happening at the, at the Room Center for Sustainable Development, um, I think there's really a lot to talk about, right? But just before we dive into that, I would like to call on Samuel again. Uh, let's try. Samuel, are you there? I think that he just dropped it, Kelvin. So we we should just oh, okay. uh, jump in on our debate. Ah, okay, great. <laughs> okay, so uh, well, I think we'll eventually find a sustainable connection for him. So um, great. So so I think uh, one of the questions that uh, come off top the list is. In the light of COP26, right, can the integration of the sustainable development goals as the main framework to support the decision making process of foreign energy investment help global South nations to become more sustainable? So I, I don't know, is, is there a better way to rephrase this question so that it's, it's more, you know? Uh, yeah, we, we, we can start with, uh, with um, Demi, if I can start with you. Um, how would you, when you're deciding on investment uh, in emerging countries startups, how the framework of the SDG impacts or influences your decision as a company um, for these startups? And um, you think this is becoming uh, a rule in the market or it's a more, um, some companies are already applying and some of them are lagging behind in terms of considering sustainable development as a decision-making framework? Thank you very much for the question. I believe that it's a, a bit of a hybrid and it depends on each, from company to company. Uh, within Total Energies, we have a team dedicated to looking at the SDGs that are coordinating company-wide and uh, taking positions on, because of course there's 17 of them and we know that we're not gonna be able to, you know, fulfill all the SDGs, you know, in one single project. But what we do look at, so if I look, first of all, company-wide uh, is the fact that we signed on to the UN Compact and we recently took on some additional com uh, commitments this September, especially towards SDG 7, which is access to clean and reliable uh, energy for, for all. And so one of the things that we do look at is how do we then promote this SDG? So in light, so for instance, that SDG was one of the driving forces beyond our commitment, uh, behind our commitment to reach 100 gigawatts of renewable electricity by 2030. So we're saying we know we need to speed up action. We know that uh, there's not been enough action on enough investment, especially along that SDG. And we know that it's important uh, because today nearly 600 million people on the African continent do not have access to electricity. So we know that it's key. And we don't also want to replicate the mistakes of the past. So we don't have to uh, promote this access using unsustainable means. And so it's important that people get access, but they get it in a sustainable manner. And so for us, we're going to significantly ramp up capacity. And of that 100 gigawatts, a third of it will come from emerging markets because we know that that is the markets where that primary access is needed. And then if I now drill down to the investments we make in startups, it forms part of the framework for us. And so when we look at investments, we're looking, we want to make sure that it has a net positive impact on, uh, you know, on the society. And so for us, obviously, SDG 7 is key and it's at the heart of what we do when we invest in especially around energy access. But we also look at other SDGs, looking at SDG 8, for instance, is, is it going to pre provide access you know, to economic growth, to sustainable jobs? So that's really big for us when we're looking even at an energy investment. 
SDG 5 also, it's really personal, close to my own heart. And so we're looking at it as well. So does this, I mean, does it promote gender equality? Uh, if we're providing access to, like, even looking at access to electricity, I visited a village in Ghana about three years ago. And the women said, look, if we have access to electricity, and we're able to be, uh, we're able to power refrigerators. We'll be able to sell fresh fish rather than dried fish, which commands a lower cost in the market. So it affects not only their economic livelihoods, but their ability to sustain their own families and to have a sustainable income. So for us, really, when we look at energy, it's not just energy as itself, but as an enabler for many of the SDGs. When we're investing in energy for mobility, we're looking at sustainable cities, SDGs. 11 so for us it's really important as well you know that cities become smarter and they're more sustainable even as they grow and so definitely for us the SDGs are the heart of our decision making we're looking at them and we're also monitoring the impact so when we do invest so we look at it at the beginning but then we also send out you know annual um, requests for so we get quarterly reports from our portfolio companies and we do an annual report at the end of the year looking at the impact they've created how many jobs how many people have gained access to electricity how the uh, equivalent has been avoided. So we are also monitoring the impact of our investments even after the life of the investment. That's a, such an important point, uh, Demi. And it's interesting to see the, the diversity of the SDGs in terms of the strategy, but also the evaluation point, because I think if you, we don't monitor the impact, can, can you have a risk to not understanding just on the selection, but not guaranteeing that they are being implemented. Marvin. As a young professional on the same sector in the industry, how, how you see on your experience uh, the, this framework being applied uh, on your daily routine, on the companies or clients um, that you interact with? Yeah, so it's a, it's a framework that is being considered for a lot of investments that we're making um, across the industry. So in terms of, you know, the, the technologies we're developing today, we're looking at making sure that SDG 7 is addressed, you know, it's about clean, modern, affordable energy. And so we're trying to decarbonize our operations across the oil and gas sector. So at the heart of the new technologies that we're developing and designing, we have SDG 7, but we're also investing in a number of initiatives across nations of the world. We're investing in SDG 4 um, and SDG 5, and we're making sure that we have um, a good representation of women and we're supporting women's education across the world. So we have a number of initiatives. For example, we have the SEED initiative that's looking at quality education for kids, especially in the global south. And I'm running one of the projects for Slumberge in Nigeria and West Africa, making sure that we have children getting into schools, we're building schools, we're also giving them access to STEM education and very quality STEM education. We have SDG um, you know, six, for example, at the core of what we do as well, supporting healthcare across um, different countries of the world. During the pandemic, there was a lot of investment in getting vaccines and uh, masks delivered to some of the countries in the global south, just making sure that they are having access to proper health and well-being um, in these places. So SDG 7 is really critical to some of the investments that we we're making. But there's also something called the ESG framework, which is critical as well, making sure that each of these investments have you know, environmental, social, and governance uh, um, uh, impact. And so that also is critical for getting investments um, from you know, the investors. If we do not have ESG at the core of what we do, and especially sustainability at the core of every decision that we make, we're not likely to get the investment. So they are really, really critical. Perfect. Dr. Muzonda, I, I will get the high level perspective now. Um, working with sustainable development, um, you mentioned about the work with Fennel um, and the renewable energies. What is your perspective that you think are the companies doing all they can with the framework or you think uh, there is a, a room space to do more uh, on the investment strategy considering sustainable development framework? Well, thank you so very much for that question. Um, uh, firstly, I want to say that just not so long ago on the 7th and 8th of October, um, the Italian government hosted a meeting in Rome um, entitled African Encounters Summit, which brought together 
a good 47 ministers of foreign affairs and environment from Africa and also some different stakeholders, including us as the United Nations, because Italy right now is also hosting the G20 presidency and also the co-presidency of COP26. So at this very high level and multilateral process, what we're beginning to see more and more, and I'm glad it's happening now than, um, than before, is also how the referencing to Africa and possibly the global South, not just you know, mentioning and saying the third world, no. We come, Africa comes to the table as an equal partner. And when they come to the, to the table as an equal partner, they're also part of the co-creation that's happening. We know for sure that there's been incredible innovation that has emerged on the African continent, the FinTech elements, uh, the work that has happened, et cetera, and a lot of social innovation that is happening. So back to your question. So what we've seen within this multilateral space and also from the UNDP side, we have a presence in 150 countries, a presence in 47 of those happening to be on the African continent, is also how we leverage and we pivot and working with governments to see what are those frameworks, because us as the UN agency that's doing the SDG integration, we also have to find out, you know, is, is, is at the country level, for instance, is Nigeria, in fact, Nigeria is leading quite a lot. I mean, are they investing in part of this integration? And what is that budget sector element within, you know, within parliament, within legislation, within policy around the energy factor? And what is the conversation, but also what is the bridging in terms of the connection to the global north? A lot of the discussions that we've been having have been very much around the technology. And I think this is going to come up a lot in COP26 because part of the conversation is a little bit what our Mervyn also touched on. We also have to talk about, you know, we cannot just talk about technology from the technology sense. You know, how is it just? How is it actually uh, making sure that it's creating equal measures? And we've seen examples that she talked about, you know, cold storage, um, mechanisms, education, and all of that, meeting these other elements so that we leave no one behind. How do we really measure? that actual um, you know, element of meeting all those different indicators that at a very granular level. So what's happening is as we do the connecting and as we do this dialoguing and the conversation global north, south, east, west is really understanding that also Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent that is dealing with different elements. What you see in East Africa is not the same way that you see in West Africa and West Africa within the Sahelian region that is dealing with its own complexity, but also opportunities. What exactly are you dealing with? I was just talking to a group of food processing um, company in Nigeria, and, and all they said is we just need to be able to, to talk about technologies on just processing and drying. We also need to talk about the element of energy. You know, Nigeria is one country where I've been, where I heard so much buzzing noise. I, was, I just wasn't sure what exactly was going on, but it's just use of generators everywhere because of fossil fuels. But also we've seen how in the North, we've basically talking about, you know, solar voltaic, uh, we've seen how NL is investing in different sort of, you know, companies and also uh, investing in making the infrastructure um, at, the, at, at the Africa level, but also making sure that the employment is done at the Africa level to make all these photovoltaic cells is important. It cannot be something that is just, you know, you bring in the technology and then you bring in the expertise. So we're beginning to see a shift. But also we're beginning to see, similar to the conversation that's happening around the vaccines, what are the opportunities to actually have those kind of companies on the African continent? Rwanda is a case in point. And I think one of the things that was mentioned was this element of secularity. I think energy also provides that opportunity of how we can really be resource efficient and also be circular in our economies because part of this absence of secularity is also having an impact on climate change, giving us impact as one of the most vulnerable, if not the most vulnerable continent. And as such, we need a rethink around how we deal with all of that. And so back to your question, yes, I think a lot of opportunities happening for this integration to happen. And I think this, this element of saying, you know, the global South, I, I don't think we want to, to put it in a narrative that says we're just receiving. I think we're also part of that decision-making process and providing guidance on what works and also, you know, sharing and teaching, uh, you know, the global North in terms of what opportunities <laughs> are there. Um, I mean, FinTech is a case in point. I'm, 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 I'm here in Nairobi right now where I can tell you that FinTech technologies have been instrumental in changing how we do transportation, secularity, uh, food systems, et cetera. This is so important. 
but the basis and fundamental of that is the absolute, absolute access and availability of energy over. That's, that, uh, uh, as a Brazilian, I mentioned to you before, I think this perspective of not treating the whole global south as one unified line where you just say everybody that's below, it's the same. It's so important for us when we are doing not only investment, but also public policies, how we bring the debate, how we bring the leverage of the voices. Um, diversity is really important, so we can include everyone in this just transition. Um, it's a really important point to have this perspective um, considered when we go to the debate, especially with events like COP26 happening next month, which impacts a lot the reality of many countries in a different way, I think, in the global south. But also, um, together, we are stronger, I think, on the debate. So we, we need to collaborate and be together on how we make our, our demands um, of investment and um, consequence that it, they have. Sam? Can I try yeah, I once again? Um, I know that you work it with the you, you work directly with the United Nations on the SDG seven as well. Um, what is your perspective in terms of the, the SDGs on investments decision? Happy to hear. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, without much ado, uh, I think at this point in time, um, mentioning that policy is at the heart of decision making, and um, the UNDP is doing a lot. Uh, I remember the compact with the SC for all and global partnerships on energy, uh, particularly targeted at uh, African countries and the global south entirely. And uh, in reaching the net zero uh, uh, targets faster and uh, staying true to the Paris Agreement, I think to, to get faster, we have to uh, go 25 times our progress now, and which calls for, uh, and, and calls for efficiency and, of course, integration of a lot of things we've heard about technologies, we've heard about innovations coming to the heart of it. And then the case for heating, cooling, transportation, and, of course, building energy consumptions are components of this mix we're talking about. We should be also talking about uh, energies, renewable energies in cities, how do cities consume energy, and how does this measure up to the efficiency? And of course, the whole huge chunk of cities and rural centers need to be mainstreamed and to renewable energy. And it's just about working on efficiency all the way. So it's a huge challenge to meet such a target by 2050, I think. But the pro a whole lot of progress is being made. I've been part of many uh, global partnerships. And of course, uh, our energy transfer for efficiency and uh, renewable under the Energy Development Foundation is doing uh, a lot of partnerships and we are aligning to uh, several uh, uh, things that pertain to the sustainable development goals and interlinkages of the SDGs because we know that when we're talking about energy we're talking about women impact we're talking about decent jobs for youth green jobs and of course green growth and generally we have to put this whole thing holistically and uh, understand that we have young heads who have strong uh, uh, capacities to put a, a lot of things in shape and of course, the youth uh, side of it is that we are helping youth develop good strategies, understand what uh, environment, social uh, governance ESGs are in energy uh, technologies. And of course, as we're building up to the COP26, uh, I think it's good we are having this conversation. So to attain the Paris, we must drive this in an integrated way for efficiency in renewable energies. And when we are talking about uh, efficiencies as well we should also look around areas where uh, energies directly impact the economy and then the health and then the social and environmental cost of good energy and bad energy and we also should be talking about the uh, social health and economic benefits as well so understanding that investment potentials on the so-called uh, some so-called couple renewable projects are, are, are actually uh, putting a whole lot of um, trade-offs into the whole system. And then what is consistent definition of net zero? Because net zero ex especially is not total zero. So we should also work on, um, I think decisions should be made on uh, investment in zero energy, uh, zero, uh, zero emission energy strategies and what uh, are these constant definitions. We've heard about the 24 seven energy uh, zero energy efficiency of the SA for all and of course we are keen into that in making sure that we align uh, grid, uh, grid solutions, grid technologies of grid are uh, efficient enough to maximize uh, investments that are available for renewable energy. So investments that are focused on carbon neutral or zero carbon projects uh, must add its own value chain which have to pass a whole lot of policy quality criteria and of course 
uh, the importance of digitalization and digitization rather in carbon accounting, uh, you know, uh, carbon efficiency, and of course, carbon mayor. Overall, measurements of carbon. Uh, this is play a whole lot of important role in uh, addressing the needs for investors. Taking South Africa, for instance, they, they have a good strategy that helps them to you know, understand where to buy and where to set their energy. So it, this is uh, an example that uh, we uh, other other countries in the global south can also take a cue from. And of course, uh, nature uh, of offset markets. Uh, should uh, I expect it to be mature enough to integrate uh, projects with quality and durability of carbon storage and must be incentivized. So incentivization is key and we gradually have to work into a just and inclusive uh, transition strategy and the just transition just calls for uh, justice, okay, climate justice, and we have to be equitable enough to make uh, this all, all uh, strategy, this all discussion very very meaningful and of course the UNDP is doing a lot in bringing together I remember the last time we had a community of practice through the SC for all UNDP partnership we had truly discussed a whole lot of things that are bordering on youth women inclusion and of course the interlinkages of the SDGs and uh, it's a powerful conversation hoping that uh, after COP26 we can um, parties can begin to align the strategies to Paris Agreement and of course, aid themselves in reaching, uh, reaching net zero so fast. So now on power grid and of course grid networks, we can talk about innovation on grid networks. And uh, it is important also that there should be high standards in distribution sectors and there are low hanging fruits uh, that are particular about uh, energy distribution in rural areas and in urban centers. So uh, like I said, social and environmental impact uh, calls for ESG accounting, which is fundamental to screening some of these key renewable energy investments. And of course, we've seen that COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the need to delocalize production systems and bring uh, production beyond uh, just the grid, because we, can, we, we, we see that a whole lot of consumption is around healing, cooling, uh, heating, cooling, and of course, transportation. So. Um, it is important that uh, investments now begin to target, um, uh, are targeted directly at uh, the impact, the social impacts of the SDGs. So um, I think uh, with all of these, um, we, we have over 50 mini grid globally that are driven by EMEAs and over 50 um, of these are working in private sector. And it should allow uh, understanding of uh, what the market is dictating. And of course, the development needs related to the field of operations, cost, and benefits, and understanding how to buy green energy and, of course, to sell off. Perfect. Really, really glad, um, Sam, that we managed to get your, your connection stable so you could contribute. Kelvin? Um, yeah, I, I had to turn off the camera so I can have a strong connection. Yeah, that's right. Kelvin, um, I think you, you have a question as yes. well. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad, Samuel, that you were able to bring in this perspective that you just um, brought in. And one of the things that struck me, especially when uh, Dr. Musonda was speaking, because I, I see a lot of connection, uh, maybe because uh, they're on the, you know, the SDG sites, but, but uh, one of the things that struck me was, you know, the thing of measuring impact with a lot of equity in mind, you know, because the truth is that uh, there's no one size, one size fits all, right? And uh, we, we can't just say that there is one particular uh, scale for measuring the impact in, you know, all the, the global South countries. So uh, I think it has to be, a, you know, a case by case thing. Um, then also, I think Samuel brought in a very important perspective, which is the thing of the partnership, uh, partnerships, because I know that SDG 17 really borders are around partnerships to attain the goal, right? And I see a lot happening, you know, in this um, in this area, a number of uh, companies, and I know that just like Demi mentioned, uh, that uh, they, they invest a lot in uh, startups that help reduce, you know, carbon capture, uh, carbon footprint. So I, I would like to immediately go straight to another question that is very related to something that um, I think Mervin mentioned, or I, I can't remember who now, but it has to do with uh, energy and you know circularity. 
and how to improve the circular economy. And that question would be, um, is energy really an enabler to deliver the SDGs, you know, or how is energy an enabler to deliver the SDGs? So I, I don't know, we, we um, do we start from, uh, let's start from Mervin, Mervin. Okay, so my answer will be a straight yes, right? Um, we already mentioned that, Demi and I had said at the beginning, the energy system is from the SDGs and, you know, investments in energy would definitely offer several potential gains across all the SDGs. And I'm just going to give you a few examples. So whether you're investing in clean, modern energy or you know, renewable energy, and I'm always very careful not to mention just renewables because we know from what is happening around the world today, because oil and gas will still be very important. Oil and gas will still serve us all the way to 2050. We just need to be mindful of the emissions just so that we do not scale um, you know, the, the damage that we're creating to the climate just now. But back to you know, the connections between energy and the other um, SDGs. So if you invest in energy and, and create access to energy, remember that we have close to 3 billion people, like almost 40% of the world's population who are exposed today to the greatest environmental health risk, right? Which is air pollution, indoor pollution. Um, and this is as a result of the fact that a lot of people are still relying on you know, solid cooking fuels, which are traditionally firewood and charcoal. And close to 4 million people die from this every year. And these are mostly women and children. So we know that if we invest in energy, we can minimize the deaths of women and girls. We can improve their health and well being and enable access to basic services such as clean drinking water, quality education, healthcare. You know, again, remember during the pandemic, we needed energy to be able to keep our vaccines and medicines refrigerated. We needed energy to sterilize the equipment that would be used to care for the people who were in the hospitals. We needed power to be available for operations and maybe other emergencies or surgeries at the time. So energy investments definitely will deliver benefits and value to goal six, goal four, which is education, you know, goal three, sanitation and security services, women will not be exposed to a lot of violence because they have access to energy. Energy will stimulate innovation to create new jobs and deliver economic growth, which is goal eight. And all of this will be tackling poverty at some point, right? Which is goal one. And the use of renewable energy would also strengthen our adaptation and resilience to this climate hazard that we're seeing across the globe. And in turn, significantly reduce our exposure to pollution. If you invest in energy efficiencies as well, that will scale economic productivity, will drive creation of greener communities and reduce emissions related deaths or disaster. Again, delivering on our environmental sustainability goals. Energy is sure to guarantee food security as well, because we know that energy powers irrigation and can drive you know, agricultural productivity. You're, you're farming, you're producing goods from those farms. You have to preserve them. You have to get them across, you know, countries. You're not going to particularly consume all of it in the same place where it was produced. You need to get it transported to some other places. And this requires energy, powering the ships or the trucks or the vehicles that we get them there and preserving them as well. So I think it's really important to understand that energy, um, again, is pivotal for achieving any of the goals, whether up to 2030, whether up to 2050, or even our African agenda 2063. Energy sits at the heart of everything. Thank you very much, Marvin. And I, I think you have really convinced me that um, energy is an enabler. I'm, I'm really convinced, right? I was convinced before, but now I'm more convinced. <laughs> and I'm sure that uh, Demi agrees with me. <laughs> And um, she agreed with me that um, energy is really an enabler, right? And then, please, I would like to know, I would like to know your viewpoint, really, as regards uh, if, if energy is an enabler, right? Um, how do we sort of manage the balance between investing really in energy as an enabler, right? And other sort of investments, you know, uh, how, do you, how do we sort of achieve that balance? Because as Mervyn has said, uh, people are dying as a result of, you know, uh, maybe uh, using the wrong type of energy. People are having problems. Uh, women are not 
uh, economically viable because they don't have you know access to uh, to energy and many countries in the global south don't have access to energy right and uh, we hear for example that uh, electricity access over 600 million people don't have access to electricity so obviously there's no economic development now we know that energy is an enabler and we really need to invest in energy right but that's not what we are here to do you know all our lives right so how do we sort of manage the balance between um uh, investing in energy and you know running our lives well thank you very much for that question honestly i, I don't think that there has to be a trade-off uh to be honest if you look at all the excellent examples that mervin has given you you could see that energy really sits you know at the core and it's really a shame that we're still having this discussion about whether it should be a trade. How do we how do we balance these competing needs? Because uh, it's a shame if people still do not have um, access to ambulances to be able to give them emergency health care or to be able to have hospitals that are properly equipped or schools that have the right equipment and the right teaching staff to be able to give people the quality of education that they deserve. So it's a shame that we have to have trade-offs that we're actually talking about if we have to balance out, you know, we do have to invest in energy, but there's just such a huge catalog of needs. But if you look at today in the West, it's just not a discussion at all. I mean, energy is just part of the fabric of life. You can't imagine the cities are powered entirely by energy. You just really cannot um, operate in such a low industrialized mode without um, energy. And so I think it's really incumbent on us that we do accelerate the investment. I think that um, Sam made that point that we would have to do times 25 of what we're doing today if we're going to make sure that everyone has access to reliable energy. And so I think we can't slow down the investment. It's really important um, because it powers every single aspect of life. And if you look at it in terms of, you know, you talked about secularity, for instance, post harvest, harvest food loss accounts for about 67% of GAG emissions today. And so to the point that Mervyn made, if we're able to improve our cold chain solutions and we actually make sure that, you know, food doesn't waste because it doesn't spoil, the farmers will actually earn more money. So that goes to actually uh, sustainable economic growth, SDG8, because they make more money from their produce. They're able to support their families, send their children to school, be able to gain access to healthcare, reliable healthcare. It's just really at the center of life that if we had energy, there are just some discussions we won't be having today. I mean, if you, we, we wouldn't be talking about trade-offs. I think I really would want us to get to a place where the 600 million people have access to energy, but beyond that, the 3 billion people that do not have access to reliable energy, because you could be connected to the grid but have electricity one hour a week. So that is still not light. There's so much we need to do to make sure we have energy for productive use. Today, uh, if you have just light in your house, that's great. Maybe your kids might be able to get to study longer hours. But if you don't have a business to be able to pay their school fees, that, that you don't have a sustainable income to be able to pay your healthcare costs. We've, you know, just to give an example, we invest in companies that provide solar home systems, and they do it on a pay-as-you-go basis, so that people at the, you know, so that people at the bottom of the pyramid can pay whether it's fifty cents or a dollar a day, you know, to be able to access electricity, you know, in incremental. It's not that they have to pay the bill, you know, in one chunk or to be able to acquire the asset in one chunk. But what happens is that if there's an illness in the family, that's the first payment that goes away. They just simply cannot balance it. If you don't have money to get, feed your children or to pay for their healthcare, you will default on your utility bills. And so we really need to get the place where we move people off the bottom of the energy ladder, where it is a fact that they have energy at home and they have energy to be able to do go about their businesses. And so I believe that when we get to that point, then we can start to say, okay, do we do a trade-off between doing a new sports center or do we have a, you know, a, a different kind of leisure center instead? But today, I don't think that we should be talking energy. There's just no trade-off. We will not have development if everyone doesn't have access to energy. Thank you very much, Demi. And I, I, think, um, I think that's something very, that's something very essential. Um, I like the fact that uh, we are coming to the realization that energies are the center of, you know, uh, achieving the SDGs and the center of almost, you know, everything that we we have to uh, we have to do in terms of economic development. And I would like to know Dr. Musonda's uh, viewpoint on this, Dr. Musonda. No, thank you so much, and I'm so glad that um, both uh, Demi and Mervin spoke before me because they they really put examples. And and unfortunately, I'm I'm closer to 50 than I am to 21. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad because, guys, we're in 2021, 2021, I mean, think about it. Um, and here we are dealing with problems that somebody sitting in Europe would have said that was a, that was a 1970 problem. 
So here's the situation. What we've seen at the policy level for sure is that um, last year when the pandemic hit, closed down, you know, lockdown happened, et cetera, what the world or perhaps what Africa may have missed is that President Kagame actually banned the use of charcoal in the entire city of Kigali. Now, the city of Kigali is 1.4 million people. Where is their charcoal coming from? For those of you who know the size of, of, of Rwanda, it's a tiny country, but it has part of the Virunga landscape. And I started a massive program there on gorillas. And a lot of the charcoal and firewood biomass, which a lot of Africans use, was coming from the Virunga landscape. And for those of you who know, is that the actual mega income for Rwanda is tourism to see those very rare and only in that landscape mountain gorillas. So how do you do that? So at the policy level is to make sure that that person who is in the slum or who is in middle income or living somewhere, there's a policy framing there that they can have access either to a mini grid or access to you know, gas for cooking. And there's also a policy shift in terms of the cost of that. It's back to your point, Demi, in terms of, you know, where do you draw the balance in terms of what am I gonna pay for versus what I'm not gonna pay for? And then at the same time, it's during the same pandemic where we experienced, I mean, to this day, we have at least 9.8 million children who are out of school, out of school, partly because of the pandemic, but also partly because of inaccess to education. So what are we saying? So we are also beginning to, to, to reflect and we need an interrogation on that. What does it actually mean that we are leaving, even as we talk right now, we are already leaving a whole constituency behind. Now, what this pandemic has done is to take us back to 2008 poverty levels. And we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. Now, here is where the reality is coming. The reality is coming in the element of innovation. And Samuel, thank you so much for actually talking about it. We need to actually move fairly quickly, that leapfrogging, where the innovation is coming from. And I can tell you for free, this continent, the young people, the amount of innovation that is emerging is phenomenal. The actual amplification of that is how do we tell the story? It's back again to what you mentioned, Sam, is the impact. How do we measure that impact? Here's the baseline. We're now living in a post-pandemic world. We've accessed what the work that you're doing. We've done this for 10,000 people, 10,000 women, 10,000 youth, et cetera. But this is how we're amplifying. And in the next two, three, four years, we want to see this. Let's come back two, three, four years from now and revisit this conversation. This is the amplification. One of the things that we're doing at UNDP is to also do the matchmaking and work very closely with other sister agencies on issues such as mini grids. What does that actually mean? Issues such as regulation, the costing of the very power that shows up in the equivalent of Kibera here in Nairobi, oh. Africa's largest slum. What does that actually mean? So energy really is a very, is the common thread that cuts right through the very essence of our livelihoods, the very essence of our development. But back again to the conversation of the climate impact, because in a week's time, we'll be at COP26. How are we talking about the very impact of climate? We have seen how you know, Africa has suffered at the infrastructural level, at the very personal level. Let's put the people-centric lens at this you know, center of this conversation. People have suffered, people have died, infrastructure, the very businesses that people go to, the very job creation spaces that people go to have disappeared by mere of just having a flood in an area or just having you know slow, slow onset events. Lastly, but not the least, I wanna talk about this element of degradation. We have to talk about the, the challenge that Africa has faced. When I was at UNEP, we did produce a report that showed that biomass fuel is the mega use fuel that Africa has been using, charcoal, et cetera, firewood, and even by 2050, at least 60% of the population will still be using that. How do we reduce that percentage? And how do we make sure that we, we, we leverage and but we also really move forward fairly quickly? Because with the degradation of our ecosystems, colleagues, we have found ourselves in a pandemic because of a zoonotic dynamic, degradation of our forest ecosystems, degradation of the very landscapes, how we produce our food, how we grow our food. Demi, thank you so much for talking about food loss and the, the connection to greenhouse gases. How do we make sure that we rethink all of those elements within the context of energy? So it's important that we actually bringing a very holistic and systems thinking lens even to the energy conversation because SDGs are not just single pillars or single strings of color. 
that we see as we see them, SDGs are very connected and very holistic. And lastly, but not the least, is SDG 17, as Sam rightly pointed out, that is so critical. Right now, we need to have a conversation that is transparent, that is honest, that is empathetic, and that is really, you know, opening conversations for real collaboration. Even as we talk global south, global north, et cetera, these will be the fundamentals of our collaboration to be able to meet all the other 16 SDGs. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Musunda. And, um, <laughs> and I, I think uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing to, uh, to see I mean, to, to basically hear what you said about, you know, Kigali and uh, and then, you know, the oversight during the lockdown and the pandemic about, you know, uh, stopping the use of uh, uh, charcoal. And I know that a lot of people really go to uh, Rwanda for tourism. And if you if you think about it, what would happen if, uh, you know, this, uh, okay, wood cutting, burning and all eventually, you know, continues, right? That means over time, what happens is that uh, <laughs> that's that income, you know, uh, is cut down. And I, I would like to uh, just before we move to another another segment, I'll, I would like Samuel to um, to share his perspective about something that struck me when Dr. Musunda was speaking at the earlier stage uh, about um, we we not you know being viewed as I mean when I say we I mean the global South countries not being viewed as uh, just receiving, right? Just receiving. So we are not just receiving, but uh, we are part, you know, of um, the, the the solution also. And he's speaking about S SDG integrations. So Samuel, I'd, I'd like to know your view, and if you could give particular examples about how uh, global South countries have been parts, you know, of providing those solutions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Um, uh, like Dr. Musunda earlier said. Um, she mentioned about uh, innovation, and of course, uh, I always like to key into that word innovation because it's part of me. Considering the whole um, lot through the top bottom approach of it all, um, considering also that uh, uh, from the Global Sustainable Development Report and the Global Startup Report on Energy, which I was uh, privileged to be part of through Renewable Energy Policy Network 21, um, it shows that there's a lot of uh, actions that need to be taken in consideration of uh, what the global south and the global north are doing. And of course, we've been able to see that um, not, the north-south cooperation is a thing that is being discussed most at this point. In, in fact, as I'm talking right now, there's an African Europe Energy Partnership event I'm supposed to be speaking at, but I just had to take uh, a break of it. So uh, there is a lot of cooperation already and of course there's a development strategy that the European and the African region are also doing uh, to enhance productivity, to enhance the, the energy uh, discussion. And of course talking also about what other continents and other uh, areas are doing in the areas of partnership concentration development. I think the United Nations is doing a lot in bringing stakeholders together, the International Renewable Energy Agency and uh, other, uh, other, other areas and other, other offices of the United Nations like agency, like the UNESCO and all of that. So um, at this point in time, what the Global South is doing, uh, the Global uh, South is doing is, the Global South, we are not just consumers, because we already have things that we are aligning ourselves to as regards the Paris Agreement. So it's just a matter of us uh, taking, uh, standing up to our responsibilities, our leaders doing what they ought to do at this point in time. Um, um, I've been having uh, a lot of challenge, particularly in the area of innovation in Nigeria. It's been a lot of challenge, I must confess. And for instance, I'll take for instance the, the, the policies, uh, the startup policy in Nigeria is not favorable enough for uh, innovation to thrive. As, a, as of this morning, I was discussing uh, about the integration of blockchain technology. And of course, as it stands, no, uh, no, 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 no company being registered as a blockchain based company in Nigeria is being allowed to register by the Corporate Affairs Commission. So it's one of those challenges. We must begin to uh, deco uh, re re reorientate ourselves and begin to look forward to where do we exactly want to be in the future of governance of energy globally? Do we really want to 
uh, set ourselves back like 50 years more behind in the decade of action. So, so, so we, need, we really need to begin to look also at the areas of um, industry deep decarbonization. This, this is a step forward and this is what we've seen in, in developed countries, particularly in the United States. And of course, um, talking about circularity also, uh, uh, we, begin to, we need to begin to look uh, and to see where we have things in common with the global north. And we be, need to begin to integrate ourselves and begin to align ourselves to proper strategies to help us get to where we are. Yeah, these people have a lot of technologies more than we do, but we need, also need to begin to look into the areas of human capital development. And that's important to achieving the SDGs because we will begin to consider that, okay, how many, how many students now needs to begin to focus on uh, impact-driven initiatives to begin to promote the renewable energy across board. So it's essential that we begin to look inwards and begin to help ourselves become better. So I, I would like to yield the floor. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing, Sam. I, I think this point about technology and how circularity is, um, is essential to enable how we move ahead in terms of roadmap and technology development in our in the global south. It's, it's essential to bring this perspective on how we invest in the energy sector. Uh, we're going to move now for a kind of a Q&A. We had many uh, questions coming from the audience, which is um, I will try to address almost all of them. So I'm going to ask individually some questions so we can try to get the most uh, from our speakers and answer the, the majority of the questions we have here. One of the questions that is from Femi, and, and sorry if I'm speaking the wrong wrongly, uh, was asking in terms of uh, offshore wind turbine investment from Total and Slumberg. And I will use this uh, discussion because Femi raised the point before uh, when we were preparing for the event which is the supply chain uh, of investment in renewable energy. Um, the Global South, it's really important supplying uh, materials to, to the development of renewable energy technologies. So if Marvin and Demi can answer this question, if you guys are investing in the wind, um, offshore wind technology, but also give a brief contribution in the perspective of how important it is to consider the, the, the workforce, the cost of the commodities being exported, and how this can impact on sustainable development in the Global South countries um, on the renewable energy development, I, I would appreciate. <laughs> okay, so maybe, maybe I'll go first. Um, and I say yes, um, and, and there are different ways to invest in offshore wind, right? Because for example, Sambaje would have people leveraging the insights and expertise that they've had developing offshore facilities and working offshore to support the offshore wind uh, development or industry. And then we're also looking at supporting in terms of building technologies that can facilitate, you know, the unnesting of energy from wind in that space. Um, we have the workforce. We have people who are being, you know, working in offshore spaces in many other uh, parts of the world that can support that industry. We have the technology and we have the software as well as data to support you know, some of the work that they do in the offshore wind industry. Um, we're also aware that the Global South has the largest wind and solar resources. And so we would definitely as businesses seek opportunities to play there because again, we're not like necessarily charity. So we would always look out for opportunities to participate in some of those places because we want to create impact, but we also want to sustain the company and keep the company going. So we're definitely working in that. Um, in terms of the resources, we're not necessarily, in terms of the commodities, we're not necessarily like uh, uh, trading, you know, these commodities, but we're supporting the development um, from a workforce, perspective, from a technology perspective, from a data perspective. And we're partnering like, like Total. We're also investing in startups and working with these startups to drive uh, renewable energy development, just because we know that we have to provide access to energy for millions and billions around the world who currently do not have access. But even those who have access, we need to make sure that the access is reliable and sustainable, right? Perfect. Demi, you want to add? Perspective. Yes. yes, from Totality's perspective, I confirm that yes, we do in, uh, invest in offshore wind energy. We already have um, a couple of projects in the UK and in South Korea, 
and we are bidding for new projects. You should, some, might, some of you might have seen the press releases as well that we are bidding for some additional projects in the UK. So for us, it's part of our, so for us, renewables really means to us uh, solar, wind, both offshore and onshore, as well as battery storage systems. So for us, it's really um, those three solutions together that will make up our renewable portfolio of 100 gigawatt by 2030. Perfect. Um, Demi, I will get a second one here because we discussed, we discussed it before as well in terms of the transition, uh, comparing a leapfrog and a smooth transition in terms of the strategy of investment. Uh, and uh, Baba Tunde, one of the questions is, should we still invest in, in the, on the conventional production of oil and gas, or should it be totally phased out um, as it is today to be able to achieve the target of 1.5 degrees from the Paris Agreement? What is the perspective? Should we keep on the traditional model or should we um, go to a, um, a completely extreme side of, of phasing out the way that we invest in oil and gas sector today? Well, um, I think that that's, a, that's a complicated question. I, if I start from where we look at it, I mean, today, uh, oil and gas accounts for about 70% of our production within total energies today. We are changing our energy mix, and by 2030, we expect that this oil will make up about 30%, gas will make up 50% of our production, and the rest will be largely renewables and biofuels. And so we recognize the fact that there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a climate emergency, there's no doubt. And if we do not change the way that we're doing things now, there is no way we'll be able to stay on a 1.5 degree trajectory as far as the heat of the climate is concerned. Um, I think that it is however important to also make sure that whatever we do is sustainable. I think if you look today at a lot of the resource rich countries in the, in the global south, um, Today, that is the resource that they have. Should they go ahead and develop um, dirty or polluting uh, resources? Uh, I would say that it's, um, it, we will have to have a balance here because I think the conversation is around, do we stifle development uh, because uh, at the expense, because today, if you look at indeed um, the net emission per capita, it's really, really quite low in Africa. And so uh, I would say for us, the approach that we've taken is that we will move forward with gas, which is a cleaner fossil fuel, for the moment for the transition period until we are able to be able to get to that place where we can go i mean fully renewable because today yes it's true that some points of the fact that we're talking about net zero emissions so we're not talking about zero emissions but we're talking about net zero which means we're balancing it out looking at reducing the intensity of our carbon mix um looking at it also in terms of you know putting in place both natural and artificial carbon sinks uh, so i think it will have to be we'll have to act on all the levers so today, it's not just really about the product itself. We also have to act on demand. If you look at it today, we could see that we expect that we'll reach peak oil by 2030. And so especially in the West, and, you know, we're starting to see that there will be a decline in the, um, in the demand for you know, fossil fuel-based energies. Uh, the UK just unveiled its plans that it wants to go completely renewable by 2035. So there's a real action. We don't want the global south to be left behind, but we do also have to think in a way in that which we can sustainable develop, sustainably develop these economies. So I believe that there will be about a 20 or 30 years of transition where we should avoid bringing on board new pollutants. Like for instance, Total Energies, we exited coal several years ago. I think we should avoid bringing on board new capacity that is really, really a polluting like coal. I believe that to avoid having stranded assets, because some of these assets have a lifespan of maybe 20 years, we should produce some of these assets you know, for their lifespan. In terms of making new investments, we really then have to make sure that we're using the newest technologies to make sure that the emissions are as low as possible, that we're avoiding completely flaring of gas into the atmosphere. So we will have to also make sure we ramp up our ability to store carbon. Uh, and also to be able to do carbon sinks. So, so for instance, Total Energies has committed 100 million towards natural carbon sinks. So every year we will invest in reforestation uh, to be able to make sure that we're absorbing the carbon that we also that we might emit. So I think it will have to be a mixed grill. We have to be a balanced uh, mix of solutions between this phase that is the interim uh, phase, the transition phase, before we can get to that place where we can truly talk about zero emissions. Perfect. I, I think you gave a really clear view on how this transition will happen for, for a, a, a company perspective and also how to guarantee that the global South countries are in a smooth way to be um, sustainable in the way that they achieve this transition from a job perspective, investment perspective, um, rather than the leapfrog that sometimes is required um, by one side of the, 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 the discussion. 
Sam, I will put a, the, the last question to you, uh, which is came from my, my colleague on the committee here in London, which is uh, Sandy was asking, should we consider environmental and climate justice in the global south to inform investment in, this, in the energy sector, or these investments should be purely economical uh, when they are being decided by, by the companies and government? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I think we have to go side by side. And um, we, um, the first points I mentioned on this part was uh, we have to consider the health, economic, social, and environmental cost of good and bad energy. Yeah, uh, climate justice is very, very important. And of course, the youth are making a case for that already in Africa and in the global south. And uh, I'm privileged to be part of the youth agitating for that, and I'm happy I'm, I'm doing so. And um, <clears throat> Talking about the economic aspects, of course, there's no how we're going to uh, do a lot of impact on the ESG, and we're not going to be considering uh, what uh, the, 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 the entire economic uh, outlook is going to be like. So, um, like, for instance, talking about responsible production and consumption on this part of uh, climate justice, uh, we have to begin to, uh, of course, consider uh, technologies in smart ways and, uh, of course, modern ways of uh, working things out in that perspective. And of course, um, in terms of governance, it is important also that uh, uh, governments in the region begin to align themselves into the, of course, there's this Africa Development Bank um, uh, framework for, uh, for reaching uh, global uh, energy, so, uh, energy demand, and meeting up demand and all of that. So it's about creating uh, uh, enough markets for uptake. It's about uh, the decisions of uh, policymakers. It's about decisions of investors and, of course, uh, public development banks. It's about stopping putting ends to, of course, additional licensing of, of fossil-based uh, uh, technologies, and of course, considering a, a divestments from fossil fuel uh, to renewable energy, like. Uh, Demi has mentioned before what the plans of the total energy is. Yeah, it's fine. It's absolutely beautiful. But what we should consider is we uh, there's a way we can actually uh, take off from where we are. And it's about um, strategically walking away from uh, this uh, fossil fuel damaging uh, energy investments. And it's simple. It's just a matter of what the agreement should be. Afterwards, it's just a matter of well, how we should work on ourselves. And of course, there's this um, industry decarbonization, industry deep decarbonization strategy uh, by the um, uh, Clean Energy Ministry. Uh, of course, that way is an approach that ministers can gather together and begin to tell themselves the truth how this can be achievable, because it really can be achievable. And I would like to uh, drop the mic at this point. Really, really good point. I will give it to Kevin. Great, thank you very much, Samuel. And yes, thank you very much, Kate. And um, I, I think uh, just sorry, uh, before we before we close, uh, because we're really running out of time. Um, a lot has been said, and <laughs> and I think uh, one of the takeaways from here is that uh, energy is central to achieving the uh, the SDGs and uh, improving the social economic uh, um, situation in global south countries and it should not be taken for granted. Uh, I think we also understand clearly that, just like Demi clearly said, that there are really no trade-offs, right? We shouldn't be talking about trade-offs because um, we, we should have passed you know, this level of uh, no energy access, right? And uh, another thing um, that, that, has, that is clear really is that the SDGs are the center of decision-making of both um, the, the companies you know, at different levels and um, of course, uh, those in the SDG side are always thinking about constantly how to achieve the SDGs. And I think it's very important, and I'm glad that we had this conversation today, uh, because as you know, uh, being the, the, the last round table before COP26, we hope you know, that uh, the COP26 will also uh, you know, really touch, touch on this, you know, these conversations, and uh, hopefully uh, there will be you know, very useful and helpful outcomes. And, just like Samuel said uh, lastly, that there needs to be very, you know, clear agreements, you know, and uh, that handshake needs to be firm, you know, so that we can see how to uh, achieve, um, uh, uh, you know, effective 
um, delivery of the S SDGs. So uh, over to you, guys. Thank you very much, Kelvin. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a privilege to have our four incredibly uh, insightful guests with us today. I'd like to say a huge thank on behalf of the Energy Institute, YPN London and YPN Nigeria, and most important, Generation 2050. Today, me, uh, Samuel, Mervyn, and Dr. Muzomba, who was here with us today. Thank you to our audience online for taking part too. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. I have two, not in reality, three final responsibilities. First is to thank the supporting partners and networks who are backing the Generation 2050 and this important intergenerational dialogue. You can see their names on the slides. I'd like to you to encourage you all to visit our landing page where you can find our manifesto and in full, detail, in full and details of the next activities underway as part of Generation 2050. The previous roundtables round are available for free on our uh, on the EIS YouTube and at our website, which I will just post on the chat to facilitate your life so you can go there and access. And here is my third responsibility. As part of the YPN London, we are running an event next week, which is Skills of the Future. Uh, it's going to be four um, events speaking about the future, the opportunities we have in our sector. Uh, talking about the green skills, we're going to have the support of Wonderful and many other great speakers to talk about diversity in our sector and leverage the voice of Generation 2050 and attract more and more great professionals to our sector. So I'm also including here the link for the event. So if you want to join us next week, it will be a pleasure. And again, keep connected with us, follow us on LinkedIn. It was a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you again for our speakers to support our event. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Have a good day.